Hello, my name is Sam Harlow and I'm the online learning kinesiology, public health education, community and therapeutic recreation librarian for UNCG libraries. UNCG libraries create a series of webinars for the UNCG community on online learning and innovation. So welcome. In this series, different UNCG instructional technology consultants, ITS staff and faculty will cover topics on online pedagogies, UNCG instructional technology tools, such as Canvas, Google, Box, et cetera, and more. These 30-minute webinars are recorded in WebEx meetings and placed on the library webpage, which I will drop in the chat now. So um, we also give the recording file to the ITS or staff member or ITC that's doing the um, talk for them to do what they will with it. So um, I am going to cover some logistical things about how the webinar is going to run. Please mute your audio during the presentation by clicking the audio icon next to your name to turn it red, but feel free to turn your audio back on while to click the audio icon again at the end of the webinar to participate in a conversation with the presenters. If you do not have a microphone, you are also welcome to participate in the chat. So if you have any questions throughout the webinar, please put them in chat. I will track the questions while the presenter is presenting the materials. So if you have any technical issues, you're welcome to email me. I'm about to put that into chat and we'll work it all, um, out offline and I'll call you if I need be. So today, Tuesday, October 8th, uh, we are having a session on web accessibility resources at UNCG hosted by Melanie Ely, our UNCG online web accessibility coordinator. So um, Melanie, you can get started. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for introducing me and thank you for allowing me to uh, have this webinar. So uh, today we're going to talk about web accessibility resources at UNCG. And this is going to be just a basic introduction to um, create an accessible online content and also we'll share uh, some information about how to access some of our campus resources. Our uh, topics, discussion topics for today. We're going to look at a basic um, understanding of accessibility. So we're going to talk about a few myths, uh, going to debunk a few myths that are commonly um, thought about when you think about accessibility. Uh, we'll also talk about benefits. And then we'll move into looking at five of the seven basic accessibility elements. And then we'll finish off with looking at some campus resources that we have uh, for accessibility. So one uh, common myth that people think about when they think of accessibility is that accessibility doesn't affect many people. And this is actually not true. Uh, there's about 57 million people in the US who have a disability and about 1.5 billion worldwide. So that affects a lot of people. Another common myth uh, that people have is that, or think about is that you don't have to worry about accessibility um, or you only have to worry about it when you get a request or a complaint about accessibility. That is also not true. Um, it is always best to create content that is accessible um, and creating when you're developing that content that you're factoring in. Um, because if you do get a request or a complaint um, after you've created your content, it's always so much harder to uh, retrofit a course website, um, that online content. And typically when you're getting a request or a complaint, you're having to make, you will be required to make those, uh, those changes. And not only are you making those changes, but you have to make them within a small amount of time. Um, so trying to uh, redo uh, a website or uh, a course uh, within a restricted timeline can be very difficult. Uh, to do. So it's always best, like I said, to, to create that content with accessibility in mind from the beginning. So um, in understanding accessibility, uh, of course, we have uh, certain, a certain group that directly benefits 
uh, from accessibility, and that would be people with disabilities. And so you have those who are uh, have a vision impairment, could be blind, low vision, color blindness. Um, also, those who may have a hearing impairment, which would include uh, deaf, hard of hearing. Those who may have limited mobility, uh, maybe they are in a wheelchair, have limited range of motion. Also, those who have a cognitive or a learning disability, <clears throat> which some examples would be dyslexia, ADHD, auditory processing, Asperger's syndrome. And then those who may have a temporary disability can also uh, be affected by accessible content. Uh, for example, someone with a broken arm, uh, someone maybe who is pregnant or has a, an illness that um, is, is not a long lasting illness. Video here that I'm going to show. And uh, this just gives a little more information. Imagine if 90% uh, of the websites or mobile apps you use today locked you out. Uh, this gives a little bit uh, more information about those who um, have a disability and how it affects, um, affects others. From the beginning. Imagine if 90% of the websites or mobile apps you use today locked you out. Everyone else continues to experience the convenience of mobile banking, the connectedness of social media, and the freedom of online shopping. But for you, they're inaccessible. For the 57 million people with disabilities in the United States, this is their everyday experience. People with visual, auditory, motor, speech, and cognitive disabilities rely on assistive technologies and alternate methods of interaction to use digital documents, web, and mobile apps. People with visual disabilities may rely on screen readers, braille displays, zoom functions, or high contrast colors to get value from what's displayed on screen. People with auditory disabilities often rely on captions or transcripts for video content. People with motor disabilities might require speech-to-text software or keyboard-only interactions. People with speech disabilities require a non-vocal means of interaction. And finally, people with cognitive disabilities often require thoughtful and organized layouts with clear direction. Digital accessibility is the practice of making digital documents, web, and mobile apps accessible to everyone, including people with disabilities. So that gives you um, an idea of who um, have disabilities are affected. Right. Um, gives you an idea of how those who um, may have a specific disability affected by um, inaccessible content, uh, online, online content. 90% of the... Okay, so, of course, we know that um, those with people with disabilities directly benefit, but all of us can benefit from accessibility. And I have another video here that I'm going to show you, um, which talks about how uh, without disabilities may uh, benefit from accessibility. asked who benefits from accessible products and services the simple answer is that we all do but that doesn't completely answer the question accessibility benefits a wide range of people with disabilities by ensuring that the product or service can be used by people who use assistive technologies or who use alternative ways of accessing content However, accessibility also benefits a wider group of people. For example, a parent juggling a child in one hand and checking their balance on their mobile, which has large buttons and clear type. A commuter reading a website on their tablet, which is responsive and uses clear and good sized fonts. Or an older customer using a voice assistant to check the weather. Will it rain this evening? Sunny all day. Or a childminder 
using captions on educational videos while the children she's looking after sleep. You see, accessibility isn't just about disability. It's about good, thoughtful design, which makes it easy for people to use a product or service regardless of their situation. To find out more, visit barclayscorporate.com forward slash accessibility. So, um, like I said, can benefit. Um, a lot of the examples that they showed in that video, I have used personally and use regularly. So um, while there are many people who have to have um, some of those accessibility features, a lot of us uh, who don't require them to access content, but we can still use them and benefit from them. Now we're gonna move into uh, covering some of the basic elements of accessibility. Uh, we're going to go over text, descriptive hyperlinks, color, headings, and structure, and also alternative text. So with text, things that you want to uh, consider are your fonts and also making sure that you are using real text instead of an image or a graphic of a text. I'll, I'll show you um, actually an example here. So on our accessibility resources website, we've got an example here. Example one is an image of text. This is not accessible. And the way you can tell is if you try to highlight a word, you cannot select or highlight a word individually. I'm using my mouse to try to highlight the word the, it won't let me do it. Now I can select the uh, picture or the image. Be able to, there we are. So it will allow you to select the entire image and it's the image that says the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. Um, this, because it's an image, someone who's using a screen reader wouldn't be able to access this without alter alternative text being attached to this image. And we move, we move over here to example two. This is accessible because it is actual typed real text. So if I try to select the word the, it lets me do it. And I can select other words in the, in the sentence here. So that's a very quick way to figure out if um, something that you're using um, if you have text that you're using um, and you aren't sure, maybe you're getting it from another source and you aren't sure if it's an image of text or the actual text, um, that's a very quick way to figure that out. Also with the fonts, you want them to be simple and readable. Um, they should also be legible and available. Um, available meaning that um, they're fairly common um, fonts um, aren't the types of fonts that maybe a student or an individual would have to pay for or maybe download in order to access. Um, and ideally you wanna use the sans serif fonts instead of the serif fonts um, because the serif fonts are more decorative. The sans serifs are, are less decorative, which is a lot easier to read. And particularly for those who may have a, um, a reading uh, learning disability um, and also maybe if they have a, a visual impairment, um, the less complicated, the less decorative fonts um, are a little more readable. Um, our UNCG brand fonts, uh, we have several that um, fall under the brand, two of those the Georgia font and Palatino fonts are sans serifs and so uh, sans serif fonts. And so those would be ideal to use. So it's necessary to use accessible text because as I mentioned before, uh, images of text are not accessible by a screen reader. If there's no alternative text attached to that image of text, then the screen reader user would not be able to um, 
to access the text image. Also, if you're zooming or magnifying um, an image of text, a lot of times that results in pixelated and blurred content. So again, someone who maybe is uh, has a vision impairment and they have to use a magnifier to um, to access text that might be that might result in um, being able to read the content if it's pixelated or blurred. It's also easier for uh, those with low vision, um, kind of like what I mentioned before, if you have to use a magnifier, uh, but also those who are um, have dys dyslexia or um, other learning um, disabilities, it helps in uh, being able to read the content. talk about descriptive hyperlinks. Um, with these, you want to make sure that your hyperlinks that you use, um, that you create a good, concise description, um, and that it's short, easy to read. You want it to clearly describe where the link is going to take you when you click on it. And it's good to avoid general phrases like click here or read more. You want it to be a little more descriptive than that. Readable links are um, easier to read and understand as opposed to using the actual URL. Um, it's more user-friendly for everyone, including those who um, have a disability and may rely on a screen reader to access information. As I mentioned before, um, it's helpful because it's short, shorter descriptions are easier to read. Uh, the URLs um, are really hard for a screen reader to read. Um, also, another benefit to this is that, um, to using descriptive hyperlinks, is that it allows you or the reader to um, have a preview of what's to come. And specifically for those who are using a screen reader, um, the screen reader will alert the user that a readable link is present. So um, we're going to move into color, talking about color, but before I do that, I wanted to show just a um, example of uh, can actually create your descriptive hyperlink. So here I have a, a video that I, I'm going to show as a part of an example of uh, using color. Right now there is a link. The URL basically is the link. I wanted to use that it's titled um, Inaccessible versus Accessible Use of Color. I'm going to, and so I already have my URL here. If I just um, click anywhere inside of the URL and then right click, you that comes up, I'm going to go to edit link because my link is already here. I'm not going to do anything to the URL itself in the address box, but I am going to go up to the text to display box and I'm going to remove the uh, text to display. Right now it's showing the link, the URL link, and then I'm going to put in my uh, the description, which I want it to say inaccessible versus accessible use of color. Okay, and so now you see that that link has now switched from the URL to my description. Moving on to color. So with color, you don't want to use color alone to convey the meaning of uh, what it is you're, you're trying to, um, the information that you're trying to provide to your readers. So a great way to, um, I guess, use color is to combine that with another method. So for example, you can use color, but maybe also use a symbol or the text itself, um, or shapes along with the color. So the, uh, go back to my mission here. So next video is going to show you an inaccessible example of using color and also um, an accessible. Example. Let's look at an inaccessible example. 
Here we have a table with project status information in it. Next to project A, there's an empty green box. Next to project B, there is an empty yellow box. And next to project C, there's an empty red box. Individuals who cannot see the colored boxes would not be able to determine the status of the projects. Example. Let's look at an accessible example. This example is the same as the previous, however, there is text in the colored boxes. The green box next to project A says completed. The yellow box for project B says at risk. And the red box for project C states incomplete. By adding this text, the information is conveyed with both color and text. The information is now available to individuals who may be blind, colorblind, or a type of disability. So that shows you how you can still use color, but then also use text as a, an alternate method for making sure that you're uh, conveying the meaning that you want to get across to your audience. Also with color, you want to make sure that you have good color contrast. That would include text, uh, images, links, buttons, icons, um, anything really that uh, you're presenting in your content needs to have good contrast. Typically means you want a dark background with light foreground or vice versa, light uh, background with a dark foreground. Um, as you're looking at my presentation here, so the majority of my background is uh, light. And my text, which is in the foreground, I want that to be, to, to be darker. Than the, than the background. Another video here. With accessibility perspectives. Colors with good contrast. About great design that allows it to go practically unnoticed. It doesn't take much to make things confusing, frustrating. Choosing colors with poor contrast makes navigating, reading, and interacting a real pain. Design means sufficient contrast between foreground and background colors. That's text and images, links, icons, and buttons. If it's important enough to be seen, then it needs to be clear. And this is essential for people with low contrast sensitivity, which becomes more common as we age. With good colors, websites and applications can be easier to use in more situations. Different lighting conditions. Web accessibility, essential for some, useful for all. Visit w3.org slash wai slash perspectives for more information on colors with good contrast. In that video, uh, it showed some, uh, some of the, the signs. It changed the color, the color contrast so that um, initially, when the signs were shown, the foreground, the text was a bright white, and then they changed it to like a, a grayish type color, which made it harder to, um, to see. For someone who um, is colorblind or um, has other vision um, disabilities, that can be an issue. And so you want to make sure that your color contrast is is appropriate. Uh, for some uh, with specific disabilities, it will actually be impossible to uh, read or navigate or interact with your content. And for many of us, it would be difficult anyway, whether you had a, a visual disability or not. So uh, color contrast is definitely important. Okay, so next we're gonna talk about um, headings. Headings are really important um, because they create order and it helps to ensure that your content reads in the order that you intend. Really important for um, visual disabilities, for those who are using screen readers, um, those who have a cognitive disability, um, that order helps to um, keep things in line for them. Also, um, it's really important for people who use the keyboard to navigate and aren't able to use the mouse to navigate and, um, and go through or read content. 
Um, it's also very helpful because it, it gives a preview of what to expect, particularly for screen reader users. It gives audible navigational cues essential for someone using a screen reader. Without having those navigational cues, um, someone using a screen reader would have a hard time knowing where they are in the content, where they are on the, <clears throat> excuse me, on the page. Use headings when you are creating documents. Uh, would be Word, Google Docs, PDFs, PowerPoints, uh, Google Slides, and also whenever you're designing or creating web pages and websites, uh, Canvas and WordPress uh, specific styles or, or um, heading guides that you can use. Another video here, but I'm actually going to um, move to my next slide uh, just for the sake of time. So, with headings, uh, one thing you want to make sure that you do is that you are using your headings for structure, not necessarily for style or color. Um, I have known some people who um, use the styles guide in Word because they might use the heading one style in Word because they like the font, the size of the text and the color, um, not really using it because they want to structure um, their document. Not really the best way to use um, the styles guide. Um, you know, if you like it for style or color, you can just, you know, make that text the color you want it to be and the, the size font that you want it to be. Headings really should be used to divide your information into meaningful sections. I mentioned Word, Microsoft Word, uh, but Microsoft Office, Google Docs, Slides, and uh, Canvas, all three um, of those software applications have pre-formatted um, heading tools. So that basically means that you don't have to um, figure out or select, or, or I guess create the hierarchy, you can use those style guides um, because they have built-in hierarchy systems that you can use to make sure that um, if you are choosing a heading, a specific heading, like if you wanna use a heading two, every time you use that heading two in your document or on your web page, it will be the same. It'll be the same size, the same uh, style, so that you don't have to worry about going in each time you want to use that or, or create a heading two. You don't have to uh, create that every time you use that particular heading. Um, heading one um, should really be used for your title and you should only use that once in your document. Um, the other headings um, should also nest properly and uh, you really shouldn't skip headings or skip the, that hierarchy. So you shouldn't go from using a uh, heading two and then the next um, part of your document jumps to a heading four. Um, it really should be if there's something that should go under or nest under your heading two, it should be three, not a heading four or you know something um, higher than that. You want to check your reading order. Um, you want your reading order to flow. You want it to make sense. Should be read in the appropriate order and should basically be functional. So here um, I'm just showing a typical hierarchy for your headings. Like I said, heading one should be your page title, using that only once in your document. Um, you will likely have um, at least We'll use at least a heading two. If you have a heading one, you're likely going to have some heading twos in your um, document or web page. Um, these are going to be major section headings. Um, after that, if you have information that should fall under a major section heading, so you have a heading two and you've got some information that should be a subsection of that, that's where you're going to use a heading three. And so then you continue to nest there. Great to use bulleted, bullets and numbered lists. Um, you can use these under any heading. Ideally, you want to use your numbered list when order and sequence is important. Um, so, you know, if you are creating a step by step guide uh, for something, you probably want to use 
a numbered list rather than a, a, a bulleted list because you want to show that um, that step by step those step by step instructions need to go in a specific order. Okay, so next we have alternative text, and so alternative text is used when pretty much um, when you have an image that you are using in your content and you're using that image to convey a specific um, specific information or convey um, certain meaning um, in your document. So alternative text um, is going to describe your image and the description is going to be based on the content and the images function. There are several things that come into play when you're creating um, alternative text or alt text um, is what is refer to um, for short. We're not going to really get into um, the best ways to create alt text because that can actually be a pretty long um, topic of discuss discussion. Today we're just going to focus on the basic idea of, of alt text and then also how you would create that. So one of the things you want to um, make sure that you don't do is uh, don't use picture of, image of, link to in your description. So I have um, an image of Abraham Lincoln here in my, uh, on my slide. So I wouldn't want to, if I'm going to describe this uh, picture, I wouldn't want to start off with picture of Abraham Lincoln. This is someone who's using a screen reader Going to get redundant information because the screen reader is going to identify this as an image. So if my description, if the alternative text says picture of Abraham Lincoln, when the screen reader reads this information, it's going to say image of picture of Abraham Lincoln. It can be very confusing to someone who um, is using a screen reader, can't actually see the, the image. Um, at the very least, it could just be no, you know, words that really aren't helpful. Um, so you want to avoid using those uh, those phrases when you're describing your image. With alternative text, um, you want to keep the description short and to the point. I want to use the file name as the alt text. Um, so if my image if the file name was Abraham Lincoln dot JPG, um, that's what, and if that's what I'm using as my description, the screen reader is going to read that. And so if you think about images maybe that you might get from the internet, you know, a lot of times the file name is the URL and the URL can be, you know, a mixture of numbers, letters, words, um, but if you're trying to read it, it can be unreadable. So you want to avoid that and actually use a description that um, fully describes the image and is not using that file name. Another thing about alternative text, author um, of the content determines the image's purpose. So if you are the content creator or the content author of your document, website, what have you, um, how you are using the image really determines purpose and then also determines what or how you describe that image. You may have some images that you want to mark as decorative. Um, these would be images that maybe you have adequately described that image in your main text, or maybe it's an image that is just being used purely for decoration. And if the image was eliminated from your from your document or your web page, um, it will have no effect. Um, you don't need to have that image. You don't need to view the image or have a description of the image in order to understand your content. I'm going to again show you uh, here. Um, you can 
add alternative text to an image. So you want to select your image and I'm here. I've selected my image of Abraham Lincoln. And then you can select the edit alt text. Set the alt text box. And it says, how would you describe the object and its content to someone who is blind? So in Microsoft Office, a lot of times it will generate a description for you. Quite often that description is not appropriate. Um, I've gone in and I deleted the description that was generated previously. Um, so I recommend you putting in your own description because like I said, you're going to be the one to know how you're using that um, image or what you want that image to uh, convey to your audience. So if this was an image that I'm using and it is just there for decorative purposes, I could actually select the mark as decorative checkbox. And when you do that, it basically hides the image from a screen reader. So the, the screen reader would just ignore that image um, which is fine, like I said, if it's an image that you don't really need to have access to. If I am using this image to convey um, a message or to convey information, then I want to type in the box. I want to type whatever my description is. So for this image, it could be as simple as Lincoln. And the screen reader would read that as image of Abraham Lincoln. But maybe my uh, document is talking about American presidents who are known to be patriotic. It might be important for me to not only include that this is Abraham Lincoln, but maybe it would be important for me to include Abraham Lincoln standing in front of an American flag. Um, that gives you a little more details, a little more information, um, and it's connected to the uh, to my content. That again, um, with alt text, it's really about um, you intend to use that image to convey information to your audience. Why should I use alt text? Screen readers. Uh, the, the the primary reason um, so screen reader users can access your images. Um, you want to use them anytime you are um, wanting to convey information to others um, and you're using an image or graphic to do that. That would include documents, web pages, presentations, also email. So just real quickly, I won't go into this much, but there are accessibility checkers in Microsoft Office, Canvas, and Adobe Pro. Um, Office and Canvas, I think those accessibility checkers are a lot easier to use, um, a little more user-friendly. Google Slides, um, Sheets, and Google Docs, they don't have um, an accessibility checker. So that's just something to, um, Think about as if you're creating um, content using any of those. Running your checker, um, some will, there are several automated checkers or checks that will um, flag issues, but there are others that you'd have to do manually. For example, if you want to check your reading order, if you want to check your keyboard navigation, um, also really important determining if the alt text is appropriate, if it matches um, the message that you're wanting to convey. Those things you would have to check manually. And lastly, we have our uh, accessibility, web accessibility resources at UNCG. So we do have a lot of um, options available. Myself, of course, um, I'm definitely um, available if you have any questions or if you need any assistance with uh, making your web content accessible. But also departmental ITCs um, have a lot of knowledge about web accessibility. ORS may be another option as well as your UNCG um, libraries. And I will show you um, accessibility.uncg.edu.
um, website has a lot of great resources, um, including your help and requests. Um, those campus resources I mentioned, you can find under the help and requests um, menu. You can also uh, request video captions and audio transcriptions, um, particularly for online courses. If you're teaching an online course, um, there is money available that you can apply for um, to get approved for uh, captioning, the captioning or transcripts to be paid. And uh, if that happens, we actually contract that out to a third party vendor um, who will do those, provide those services. You can also request accessibility training, request um, a web consultation, web accessibility consultation. You can also report an accessibility issue, whether um, you, know, you have a disability and are finding that there's some um, accessible, something that you're not able to access. Um, or maybe you just you don't have a disability and you find that there's something that um, may be an accessibility issue, you can report that here. Um, last thing I'll show you, um, again, with the website, we have a lot of different information. Um, if you want more information about why web accessibility is important, we have uh, several, uh, we have a, well, several links for that. There's also um, how-to guides for getting step-by-step uh, -step instructions or making content accessible. I'm gonna go to that page here quickly. Um, for starting, uh, getting started with accessibility, there's a link, seven basic elements of accessible content. That's pretty much what we've covered, um, but there's even more information um, if you go to this, um, to this section of our website, um, you'll see several of the topics that we covered today. In addition to what we covered, you'll also find information about tables and multimedia, which would include um, how to, um, things you need to think about as you're creating or using um, videos and audio content. So going back to our how-to guides, um, there are three categories, documents and tables, multimedia and websites, and then presentations and forms. Um, you'll find step-by-step -step guides for each. I'm going to click on the multimedia and websites um, just to give you a quick look at that. So if you wanted, for example, to see, um, get some tips on creating an accessible video, have um, some information about that, why it's important, who benefits, but then also you'll find a creating accessibles, um, accessible videos slide, Google slide um, presentation you can use and step-by-step instructions on how to do that. And so each of our how-to guides are set up in that way. So much covers everything. Uh, I have my contact information here. As I said, um, I'm Absolutely a resource that you can use if you have any questions or if you need assistance with web accessibility. Um, also, um, like I said, our accessibility.uncg.edu uh, website has information and more. All of the things we covered today is listed there. Um, and then additional campus resources and how to contact those resources are there. Great, thank you. Does anyone have any questions for Melanie? Okay, Joe said no questions. As people are thinking about questions, I'll just let you guys know about the next coming up in this series. So the next one in the online learning and innovation series is on Canvas and analytics. It's Wednesday, November 13th at 11 a.m. Um, and hosted by Amanda Shipman, our ITS admin for Canvas. In December, we have one on tips for lecture and web capture by Michelle Folkman, the H one of the HHS instructional technology consultants. <laughs> oh, excuse me. 
We also have a, another series on research and application, which is on library online resources. So the next one coming up in that series is Journals, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly by Leah Leninger, our health sciences librarian, <coughs> to talk about the hazards of contributing to some journals, sometimes referred to as predatory journals. And then Monday, November 4th at 11.30 a.m., um, we'll have one on Scopus, which is a um, large citation and indexing database um, with a lot of science stuff and STEM stuff, but um, also some other stuff. So thank you guys for coming. If you have any questions, you have Melanie's contact information. And thanks, Melanie. Thank you. See you all later. All right, bye-bye.